Testing, testing, one, two, three. This is Kelly with Sisters Network. If you can hear me, someone can just type on the right navigation bar or wave your hand. All righty. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Sisters Network, Inc., our national board of directors, our affiliate chapter staff and volunteers, Welcome to Webinar Wednesday, hosted by Sisters Network and sponsored by Cancer Treatment Centers of America and in partnership with the Breast Health Collaborative of Texas. I'm Kelly P. Hodges, the National Program Director for Sisters Network and facilitator for today's webinar. Sisters Network is a leading voice and the only national African-American breast cancer survivorship organization. We're celebrating 20 years of survivorship this year. Founded in 1994 by Karen E. Jackson, Sisters Network is governed by an elected board of directors and assisted by an appointed medical advisory board. The organization's purpose is to save lives and provide a broader scope of knowledge that addresses the breast cancer survivorship crisis affecting African American women around the country. Sisters Network is very excited about Webinar Wednesday. Thank you to those who have participated in previous webinars, but if you've missed those webinars, please visit our YouTube channel and you can download any of the previous webinars at any time via the World Wide Web. And our YouTube site is Sisters Network Inc. And you can also download those webinars via our national website, which is sistersnetworkinc.org. A quick note before I introduce today's, today's presenter, the Q&A session will take place at the end of the presentation. So please note your questions and hold until the end we will make every effort uh, to address all questions. Uh, additional questions can be emailed to jessica.weeks at ctca-hope.com and I will type that in at the end of the presentation as well. Also today's webinar is being recorded and you will be able to access today's webinar in about 48 hours via our national website as well. Sisters Network aims to provide useful and informative information to survivors, caregivers, Health professionals are those who want to know more about health care, breast cancer, and survivorship. An advocate of patient empowerment, Dr. S Simeon Jagernoff, also known as Dr. Jag, is a medical oncologist and medical oncology fellow, director at CTCA, Cancer Treatment Centers of America, at Southwestern Regional Medical Center. Dr. Jag is joining us today because he believes it's important for patients to learn as much as they can about their disease and that, and that a seasoned board certified medical oncologist describes in great detail their diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment options. Dr. Jack earned his doctorate in medicine from Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences College of Osteopathic Medicine. He then completed an internship at Tulsa Regional Medical Center, an internal medicine residency at the University of Oklahoma, and a fellowship in medical oncology at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. Dr. Jag is board certified in medical oncology and internal medicine by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Dr. Jag is board certified in mechanical engineering and worked in research and development prior to becoming a physician. Dr. Jag has served as principal investigator and sub-investigator for clinical research studies on drugs used to treat metastatic breast, colon, and lung cancers. Currently, Dr. Jag serves as the program director for the Oklahoma State University Medical Oncology Fellowship Program, and he is responsible for training doctors to become specialists in medical oncologists. Dr. Jag also serves as a director on the Medical Executive Committee of Southwestern Regional Medical Center as a leader in medical oncology. Prior to joining CTCA, Dr. Jack practiced medical oncology at Cancer Care Associates, an outpatient cancer clinic in the Tulsa area. Dr. Jack also served as a medical consultant on the scientific advisory board of several companies, including Genentech, General Electric Healthcare, Bristol Myers Squibb, Selgin, NovoCare, and MedSync Research. In his spare time, as if he has any, <laughs> he also developed medical applications for iOS and Android platform devices, and he has published apps in the iTunes App Store for computing chemotherapy doses. 
to prevent medical errors in oncology. Wow, we are truly, truly fortunate to have Dr. Jag as a presenter today. So Dr. Jag, without further ado, I will turn this webinar over to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I uh, know. Very, you're very impressive, Dr. Jack. <laughs> Side. Okay. 
this is a this is a misnomer to think that breast cancer can spread directly from one side to the other side. There are times in which it appears that the breast cancer may start in one organ and then develop in another organ. Now those are two different those are two different cancers. I know it sounds bizarre, but there are no direct channels from one breast to another breast. What can happen, though, is uh, in certain situations where the cancer spreads to the chest wall, the the the, tra the disease can actually track underneath the skin, and that's a different disease. That's a that's a that's normally familiar with an inflammatory breast cancer. Now, once uh, the disease has been removed from either breast, uh, let's say uh, a, a, a woman underwent a lumpectomy. Uh, and there's a new cancer that is born in the opposite breast. Uh, that is not metastatic disease. That is a what's called a second primary. And it's important to differentiate between what is a second primary because that's still a very curable situation. It's not one as which is not a situation in which we should give up hope and say, well, you know, there's nothing that can be done. And even so, even with metastatic disease, uh, the uh, Breast cancer, even when it's metastatic, can still be treated very effectively. Next. So, as we described previously, metastatic breast cancer is different than recurrent breast cancer. Metastatic breast cancer is different than recurrent breast cancer. Uh, when the cancer develops, uh, it's not a new cancer. It's not a new cancer, but a, a recurrence of uh, the primary uh, disease, even on the other side. So, what type of symptoms would someone experience with metastatic disease? Well, it really all depends upon the location of the disease. For example, if the cancer has invaded into the skeleton, it's it's sometimes possible to have pain in that portion of the skeleton, such as the back or the thigh or the ribs or even shoulder or, or skull. If the cancer develops within the brain and we find this by an MRI or, or so or a CAT scan, uh, it really depends on the location of the brain that it's affecting. So sometimes that can uh, affect the uh, cognition or it can affect the uh, memory or it can affect motor function, which is localized to that portion of the brain. Uh, if it affects the speech area, then uh, the, the patient may experience problems with expressing themselves, like your speaker today. Even though you may not have that, it can be a little bit difficult to understand at times. But uh, most commonly, uh, when breast cancer occurs, the symptoms are very vague. Sometimes a weight loss, experiencing weight loss, experiencing a loss in energy, a loss in sexual function, a loss in... Uh, their normal activities of daily living. So p paying attention to this is extremely important because once you've been diagnosed with breast cancer, it's extremely important to pay attention to these things over time. See, about 30% of women who have dealt with breast cancer in the early stages, at some point in the future, they may develop metastatic disease. And 5% of women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer usually present off the bat with metastatic disease. So very important to be able to pay attention to what's going on to your body at any point in time. So how is metastatic breast cancer treated? Well, let's take a look at what does it mean to be treated. Sometimes you've, uh, you've been told, well, I'm sorry, nothing can be done from the standpoint of uh, curing your disease. Well, that's partially true. So if we think about what metastatic breast cancer represents, it's really something that is um, that's going to be part of your lifestyle for uh, as long as you live. And we look at this in terms of disease control, not necessarily curing this, because we know that if we treat patients with chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery, that we are able to prolong their lives and provide them with a better quality of life. So treatment really depends upon the type of tumor that uh, the woman has and whether or not uh, their disease is uh, in a situation that allows them to be treated. We'll refer to the 
ability of patients to be treated as their performance status, their ECOG performance status. And this tells us as to whether or not the patient is safe enough to be uh, placed through some aggressive therapies. Sometimes uh, if a patient is too weak, that is, they're bed bound, they're not able to get out of the hospital, they're, they're too ill, doing treatment in that situation could be counterproductive and not necessarily helpful. So that may be a problem for a very small segment of patients. However, there are patients who can live many, uh, many times uh, for a very long time with their disease and still require some minimal treatment. And there are some patients that no matter how hard you treat them, it, their disease may not respond nearly as well. So these are questions that can be answered with your, uh, with your physician at the time of the visit in regards to what options are available. So let's take a look at some of the treatment options for metastatic breast cancer. Well, there are agents that target certain uh, parts of the cell called hormonal agents, and these look for certain receptors on the cells that are uh, present in the pathology. When we look at the pathology, we're looking for some very specific markers, and these cells that we're looking at in the cancer cells can uh, express things such as estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen and progesterone are sensors on the surface of the cells which can, which can be uh, useful in terms of shutting the cancer from uh, functioning. So it's, these are very important uh, markers that we look at on the surface of cells to tell whether or not uh, they would respond, a woman or, or a man would respond to uh, hormone blockade. Some of the newer agents that we're looking at target a receptor called HER2, human epidermal growth factor 2. And this is a factor, this is a receptor that's present on the surface of the cell which triggers a cascade leading to cell death. Now for some women the expression of HER2 means that their cancer could be more aggressive. However, their disease is still very sensitive to this particular line of therapy. Many of the new agents that we have today target the HER2 receptor, and it's, it's important to know whether or not the expression of HER2 is present. There are still the standard chemotherapy agents available, such as the taxanes and the anthracyclines, and these chemotherapy agents work regardless of the receptors on the cells. We still use radiation because it's extremely helpful to many women dealing with metastatic disease. It's, it's very helpful for those suffering with back pain, thigh pain, leg pain, and so forth, which, uh, which in which the cancer has attacked their skeleton uh, and they require stabilization of their disease to, uh, to re retain their normal activities of daily living. Also used but not commonly used is surgery, and this can be used in places where the cancer is attacking uh, possibly lymph nodes, there's a recurrence within the axilla, uh, there are places in the brain that sometimes a solitary brain metastasis may be considered removable if it cannot, uh, if it cannot be re radiated, and so these are also possibilities, but it's a less frequently used approach. Some of the targeted agents uh, that are available is Herceptin. This is a this is a, an antibody. An antibody is a very complicated molecule, and it's it's not a typical uh, medication. In fact, it's not sometimes considered chemotherapy. These are considered immune therapies. These immune therapies are targeting a specific receptor, and the receptor that they're looking for is the HER2 receptor on the surface of the cancer cell. By targeting these receptors, we're able to do some very unique things. We're able to shut down the growth of cancer cells by creating a, a mechanism called apoptosis. And this mechanism of apoptosis is present in cancer cells to, uh, it's a normal function of cancer cells to be able to shut down their function. And this is what should happen normally. But the thing is, because of mutations along that pathway, uh, HER2 inhibition is often required in those women who have expressed uh, HER2 receptors on the surface of their cell. Some of the newer therapies that we have available involve targeting agents with 
uh, Herceptin plus a drug combined to the antibody. So this is called adotrastezumab or Ketzilla, in which these me uh, these medications uh, use chemotherapy bound to Herceptin. So it brings the chemotherapy directly to those cancer cells by targeting that surface receptor so that the cancer cells take the the antibody inside and they also bring the chemotherapy along with it to destroy the, the cells more specifically. Some of the other options that we use today uh, include uh, medications to stabilize bone disease such as Zometa and Exgiva. And both of these medications are used to stabilize uh, the, the bones from breaking. Both of these medications are FDA approved for their purpose. Although they may not improve survival, they are extremely important in being able to provide st stability to the skeleton. There are times in which neurosurgery can be appropriate, such as uh, if the cancer has involved the spine or if it's involving the brain. And the neurosurgical approach to this can be extremely helpful for those patients dealing with metastatic disease. If there are limitations in, in uh, mobility on a daily basis or problems with uh, that area being at risk for fracture, then a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic surgeon is extremely important to be able to uh, engage in that discussion. So treating metastatic breast cancer is very synonymous to treating any chronic illness as we do with hypertension, diabetes, HIV, and coronary artery disease. And what I mean by that is that cancer has very specific characteristics like these diseases which makes it extremely treatable. We've seen before the receptors of uh, estrogen and progesterone as well as HER2. So think about what would happen if you have someone such as Magic Johnson who has HIV for 20 plus years. He has been treated successfully, but he's not cured. And he's still able to live a very active and full life without any problems whatsoever. longer. Unfortunately, our, the medication that, that we have for oncology is not nearly as safe as we do for HIV or other diseases. So the medication that we currently use are still high risk and still somewhat dangerous, but they are still highly effective. And our goal here of treating any chronic illness, such as metastatic breast cancer, is to improve quality of life, but not necessarily cure, because many of these agents are not able to provide a cure just as diabetes cannot be cured and hypertension cannot be cured. We treat those patients knowing that patients can live longer with a better quality of life. This requires a paradigm change that even though the disease may not be curable, it's still very treatable. And every year we're seeing more and more new agents approved by the FDA for uh, treatment to allow women to live much longer lives and much better lives. However, unfortunately, all cancers are not, all stage 4 cancers are not the same. And when we, what you're taking a look at in this slide is the slide on the left is someone with metastatic breast cancer. You can see that their liver is widely involved. And the one on the right is a tiny white spot. You can see that white spot over here. This area over here is a very small spot of uh, cancer, this bright spot. So even though both of these women have stage 4 disease, one is characterized in the same character, uh, category as the other one. And even though this defies intuition, the one on the right is still very treatable, but the one on the left breast cancer are still lumped in the same category in terms of survival. The way that we can tell whether or not someone is doing well uh, with treatment is by utilizing a device called a Discovery 600 PET-CT. This is something that we have here at Cancer Treatment Centers of America and it allows us to be able to 
take a look at what's going on inside their body. Again, you're looking at another liver on the right, which is heavily involved with disease. The bright spots that you're looking at are representative of highly active areas of metastatic disease. And it allows us to be able to treat patients very effectively and be able to monitor the response over time. However, unfortunately, the FDA has been limiting our use of PET scan nationwide throughout every practice because they're now saying that if you have a metastatic disease and you have Medicare, you're only allowed to have three PET scans in a lifetime, which makes absolutely no sense. Think about that when you write your congressman and ask them, why is it that I'm still alive and I've already used my three PET scans? So how am I going to be able to monitor what's going on in my body without, this, without the use of the PET scans? So the Discovery 600 PET scan allows us to see multiple changes. Our, our typical PET scan is uh, something that you would see that looks like this thing like an amoeba. It's, it's uh, very cryptic, very difficult to see. And you've seen the previous scans that show that, uh, that the disease is better seen on the uh, Discovery 600 PET CT. So what are some of the new therapies that are being developed for metastatic breast cancer? Well, we are, there are some new therapies that are in the pipeline. Many pharmaceutical companies are looking at boosting the immune system, using our own immunity that is using our T cells to fight metastatic disease. Several new targeted agents are also being developed to help determine whether or not there are additional receptors which can be targeted. Some of these agents can also look at uh, anti-angiogenic process, that is, they stop blood vessel growth, uh, growth from around the tumors from taking place. Before any new therapy is made available to the public, patients, uh, patients have to be tested in something that's known as a phase one, two, or three clinical trial. And it's important to be able to have these clinical trials available because this allows us to be able to see whether or not something is either safe or dangerous. The phase one trial is a trial in which we look at whether or not a patient can tolerate any type of uh, any form or any dose of the medication. So it's escalate until there is some degree of toxicity uh, experienced. Now a phase two trial looks as to whether or not the therapy that's being considered is efficacious. Let's look at, it looks at the efficacy of the therapy. Then the phase three trial is one in which we look at this compared to what is the standard of care out there. And if we see that the patient, if we see that in large numbers that, that patients are benefiting, then this moves on to typically for FDA approval and so forth. But it's important to be able to participate in those clinical trials, and many of which can be found at cancer.gov or at the NCI cancer website. Taking a look at some of the clinical trials for breast cancer, again, like I mentioned, we, you can find these uh, through that URL list below at cancer.gov or NCI clinical trials. Uh, and many of those, if you need to find a trial that's appropriate for you, it, it's a very important to be able to discuss this with your oncologist. Say, look, you know, your current therapy is not working right now for me, but I'd like to see, am I a candidate for this clinical trial? And don't be afraid to bring this up with your oncologist because many oncologists want the best for you. They want you to be able to live a longer life with better quality without the added toxicity of combination chemotherapy. So don't be afraid to discuss this with your oncologist at all. Looking at the quality of life and side effect management associated with treating metastatic disease, there are many things that's important for us to be able to keep in mind. First of all, you have to be empowered. Many patients feel that if they're taking chemotherapy that they need to be miserable. Well, that's absolutely nonsense. You don't need to be miserable at all. It's important for women to say, look, I can't take this therapy. What can I do to be to uh, make it through this therapy or to, to do better with it? So it's important for patients to, to engage in that discussion about quality of life. So quality of life clinics and even quality of life thinking in terms of quality of life is extremely helpful because we know that if you live a better quality of life, you will 
be able to function and do the things that you want to do without being miserable. Chemotherapy, the point of chemotherapy and metastatic disease is that it should not be miserable. It should, it should be something that still allows you to be able to function without the added toxicity of taking therapy. Remember, as we said previously, that our goal here is not cure. We cannot cure this disease. So we're trying to do everything possible to, to treat. And, and that's something that's very important to understand the distinction, that while curative intent is not possible, still treating you aggressively as we would with uh, chemotherapy is still a goal without making you sicker than you need to be. Several things that patients experience while undergoing uh, therapy for metastatic disease uh, are listed in this slide. You can see anything from dry mouth, abnormal taste, osteoporosis, anxiety, pain, uh, weight loss, constipation, and so forth are issues that are not uncommon. And as many of you have sat through and listened to your doctor speak to you about what you've been through, you can hear that your doctor will probably list everything here on this slide and say that these are all possibilities and then realize that, you know what, chemotherapy really wasn't that bad. However, I did feel fatigue and I did feel problems with anorexia and I did experience problems with abnormal uh, taste and so forth and experience blood counts. But some of these things need not occur under the right supportive setting, which is why, which is why it's extremely important to make sure these things occur in a quality of life setting. So it's also very important to let your doctors know that you are experiencing pain. And if you are experiencing pain, these things can, a pain can interfere with your activity of daily living. Therefore, it's extremely important to say, look, the current pain medication that I'm not that I'm taking is not doing the job. I need something else. Maybe I need radiation to help control pain in that area. Although it may not be something that's used to treat the entire skeleton if you have skeletal disease, it's also something that can be used in a localized setting to help control the disease. The disease. Nausea and vomiting is something that's also common. However, many patients with a new targeted therapies do not experience nausea and vomiting. Some of, sometimes they can experience something called anticipatory nausea, in which the patient comes in and is anticipating having chemotherapy. Therefore, the, the stimulus itself, or the thought of being present for chemotherapy, can result in anxiety. And that anxiety manifests itself as nausea. So it's, it's a real entity. And I have patients who have reported this, and we treat them very well and very successfully using uh, benzodiazepines and things to control their anxiety. Once that's achieved and they've received uh, those medications, they can have control of their, of their symptoms very easily. Also important to know is that if patients are having problems related to nausea and vomiting, that some of the alternative therapies are very successful, such as acupuncture. I've had patients who also use uh, ginger and peppermint tea very successfully as well. While it may not work for everyone, for some patients it seems to work. It seems to be the only thing that works. I had, I had one gentleman that I treated before, and he could not tolerate the chemotherapy, even as even when we gave him many of the uh, standard therapies. So what worked for him? Acupuncture. So I said, great, keep doing it. And he continued on treatment successfully. Fatigue is something that is not uncommon to those receiving chemotherapy. And there are many medications that are standard that are also used that can be helped, that can help. And it's also important that when you're going through this to be able to get adequate amount of sleep. So being able to save your energy, using, uh, don't use coffee in the evening, don't drink a, that, that, that soda in the evening, don't eat that high calorie meal right before you go to bed, and don't try to work out before midnight. Because I'll tell you, they'll keep you up at night. They'll have your adrenaline. You'll have your adrenaline, adrenaline rushed, and then you won't be able to uh, wake up the next morning because you're exhausted. So very important to be able to uh, conserve your energy, make sure that you are still engaged in a healthy lifestyle, and doing things to help maintain your sleep quite well. Exercise is also another issue that comes up while patients are taking chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery for metastatic disease. The goal of, of continuing to do, uh, continuing to exercise is extremely important because I think that many uh, patients who 
are going undergoing chemotherapy feel that they should not have to exercise. Well, I encourage my patients and I try to tell them it's extremely important for you to be able to do this because it keeps you active. It prevents blood clots from occurring. It keeps the muscles strengthened and allows them to be able to do something other than sit on the couch and become depressed. The less active you are, the more likely you are to become depressed. And depression plays a big part in how you do overall in the long term of your well-being. Part of the depression also occurs when people are not sleeping, so it's also important to also use things that are very helpful, such as Remeron or even Ambien. But for those who are not willing to take medications, there are certain alternatives that, works, uh, that work really well, such as melatonin, in, including mind-body medicine and biofeedback. Anxiety and depression is also very common. However, there are certain medications which we also need to be very cognizant of in, in those women who are taking adjuvant therapy, such as Zoloft. We know that the interaction of this medication with certain uh, anti-hormonal blocking agents, such as tamoxifen or aromacin, can impair the utility of those medications. So it's important to discuss with your uh, oncologist and your physicians as far as what can you take safely that will not impair my therapy and will allow me to deal with the anxiety and depression associated with uh, metastatic disease. And biofeedback as well as mind-body medica- uh, mind uh, counseling as well is extremely important. I've, I believe in guided imagery, imagery and uh, pet therapy. Uh, I was speaking to one of uh, my colleagues here a few minutes ago about our dog. And even though it, my, it's my wife's dog, sometimes even petting him seems therapeutic to me as well. But I give her the uh, credit for taking care of him all the time. Uh, again, constipation can be an issue, and using things such as colase, uh, ametiza, milk and magnesia, and so on, so on can be uh, very helpful. We don't like to do uh, fleet enemas and milk and molasses enemas all the time, but they are tools that are available. Treatment of constipation, again, can include al- uh, alternative uh, uh, options such as uh, exercise, which is, again, that can that can be very helpful, uh, as well as some of the natural laxatives, such as senna and prune juice. Conventional treatment with uh, gabapentin can be very helpful for those dealing with neuropathy. Lyrica is another medication that's also available, and it's important to discuss these things with your pain management specialist. There are certain TENS units that are available. These are electrical devices which are used to stimulate the nerves and prevent the nerves from from uh, from reactivating to the point where you experience pain. So Rebuilder is, is a one is one form of a tens unit that's used, uh, and even L-glutamine is an is a simple uh, amino acid that can be used to help those with peripheral neuropathy. Many often, uh, many times, often uh, patients dealing with uh, metastatic disease experience anorexia, constipation the feeling that their stomach's full all the time, and that's that's in those who have ascites. So it's important to be able, to, it's, a, it's a very important to be able to make sure that you're not starving yourself, that you're not going on a diet, that you're not doing things to deplete your body of nutritional intake. So dealing with this can take place in the form of dietary uh, counseling, speaking to a dietitian, and even taking certain medications, such as Megase, or even the Marinol, which can help those dealing with uh, anorexia in this setting. Steroids can be used as well, but we don't like to give uh, patients steroids all the time because it can produce some problems associated with diabetes and cataracts. So the most important thing about uh, controlling your intake and watching your weight loss is to consult a dietitian extremely important for those dealing with advanced disease that's that's becoming emaciated. It's very important for you to see whether or not are you a candidate for a PEG tube. This is a tube that's placed in the abdomen to help bridge the gap between the weight loss, and sometimes that can be helpful. We try to not use TPN as often. However, it's good for the short term. And even though it's something that might sound great, it's not as good as using enteral feedings, that is using a PEG tube 
or feeding naturally. So this is a bridge, but it's not a long-term bridge. Mucositis refers to developing of mouth sores as the mucous membranes become eroded over time. There are things that, that are combined, such as cocktails included, including carafate, benadryl, malox, and certain lozenges, which can be helpful. Well, glutamine is another uh, natural supplement which can be used for this. And even se things such as low-level laser energy is something that certain studies have shown to be somewhat helpful th for those dealing with mouth sores. So overall, it's very important to pay what their body is telling them. They're, if there's something that's going on that is abnormal, pay attention to it and let your doctors know that something is going on that which needs to be addressed. Don't say, don't think that because I'm going through chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery, that my life needs to be miserable. And your doctors are more than willing, willing to work with you to find what's best to be able to treat your metastatic disease. Looking at the survival, it really depends from patient to patient. I, we're looking at the national averages. The, 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 it appears to be somewhat abysmal. However, you have to keep in mind that this is everyone lumped together with stage 4 disease. So some women with stage 4 disease can live many years, in excess of 10 years or so, while some with uh, limited disease can still have a very short survival. Because of the incongruency in these things, we're looking at molecular testing to see which therapies are best for those using targeted therapies. Looking at the molecular abnormalities of the cancer is some of the newer technologies that are being discussed and evaluated for the future. So keep your eye on this as more uh, targeted agents come out to address metastatic disease. So the most important thing is to be able to ask your doctor about clinical trials, find out what's the best therapy that's available for you, and get a second opinion. Establish your support team. Make sure that your questions are being answered and be empowered. Nothing is more frustrating than seeing someone who has been told, well, nothing else can be done, that's it, go home on hospice. While the hospice has an appropriate role, for those with metastatic disease, treatment directed at palliation can be extremely helpful. So addressing those side effects and, the, and uh, finding those targeted agents to help you and improve your quality of life it can be extremely helpful. And when you have questions, bring them up. So does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask today? Dr. Jang, thank you so much. That was a very informative presentation, um, especially for me from the perspective of a non-survivor. I learned, um, you know, I've been working in breast cancer for uh, over 15 years uh, and doing research and health disparities research. And I tell you, every time I hear a presentation from you or one of your colleagues, I always learn something, uh, something new. And also, I learn something that can help me in talking and dealing with uh, in dealing with survivors. So I really appreciate the information that you did provide today. Uh, we will start the question and answer session. So ladies, I know you have some questions. We uh, again, we want to encourage you to ask questions. You have an expert in the field of metastatic breast cancer that has your attention right now. Uh, we have an approximately 15 minutes. So please uh, start typing your questions at this time for Dr. Jag. Don't let this opportunity. Uh, pass you by. Okay. All right. And we do have Marilyn uh, who's typing, so we'll wait on her question. Uh, Dr. Jag, I actually, as you were speaking, some of the uh, phrases and words and, and things that you were mentioning, I actually posted them on our Facebook page. And uh, also, I encourage everyone that's on our um, site or on the webinar to also go to our, our website, our Facebook page, and communicate with other survivors and see all the activities and other events that are going on and maybe something um, in your area that you're interested in participating in. But one of the things that you mentioned is depression plays a major role in survivorship. And as you know, in the African-American community, um, our national slogan here at Sisters Network is Stop the Silence, because we do have a um, tendency to not talk about diseases and health issues that affect us, and specifically as it relates to mental health. 
Uh, can you give us any uh, insight on, I know you mentioned that depression plays a major role, but what, what are some of the steps that, um, that, a, that a metastatic patient could take if, if they start, or some of the things they should start looking for um, to see if depression is about to set in or, or, or just something that they can look for? What are some of the signs? partner in the process, that their sexual function has decreased over time, and that uh, they're the only ones going through this. If you find yourself spending less than 50% of your time uh, doing things that you love to do, spending your activities wallowing about what's going to happen, if you spend more time feeling so down in the dumps that you cannot function, or that you, you have no interest in the things that would normally give you pleasure, then that's a that's a time in which you, it should be uh, you should discuss these things with your oncologist or your primary care physician. Say, look, something's not right. I know this is not the real me, and even though I'm going through this and no one seems to understand me, that it's a, it's very important for me to try to get back out of that hole that I'm in. And if you feel that you're this way and you're having problems uh, with this, then it's very important to be able to get on some form of medication which can help you or change the ac change in activity or change in setting, uh, which can be helpful. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's not something to be downplayed because uh, it's, it, depression can lead to suicide. No one wants that to happen to any patient. So discuss these things with your doctor very, uh, very quickly as soon as you recognize the early signs of depression. Okay. Thank you so much. And we do have a couple of questions, Dr. Jag. Uh, Marilyn says, thank you for such a great presentation. She didn't have a specific question. However, she noted in your presentation that you mentioned triple negative breast cancer, and she wanted to know if you had any comments. Uh, uh, you commented on those with receptors and hormonal, hormonal positive. Um, do you have any comments as it relates to triple negative breast cancer for any triple negative breast cancer patients that may be listening? Yes, triple negative breast cancer is one of those cancers in which uh, there are no estrogen receptors, there are no progesterone receptors, and, and there are no uh, uh, herceptin or HER2 receptors. Now, what does that mean? It means that the cancer has some very aggressive behavior, or very aggressive features. However, with triple negative breast cancer, it tends to respond actually better than those which are hormone positive. So even though it, the disease may be triple negative, for some patients, they respond really, really well to chemotherapy. So that is something that needs to be watched very closely. And even though it may seem difficult at the time or it may be a challenge, um, those women dealing with triple negative breast cancer still have many new chemotherapy options that are available. Uh, also, if you have additional questions which are not answered today, I'm going to post my URL in the comments here at uh, drjag.com. And if you want to ask questions there. You can also like my Facebook page, which will tie into your page. I'll be happy to uh, connect with you that way on Facebook as well. Okay, and we will also, Sisters Network uh, will post that information as well via our social networking sites. We have several Facebook pages and also our Twitter page as well. Thank you so much uh, for that response. Marilyn, I hope that uh, provided some insight to you as it relates to triple negative breast cancer. Our next question is from Eddie. Um, he said his wife, and, and welcome, Eddie, we have a man on the line. He said his, his wife starts chemo on Friday, and she's been experiencing severe pain and fatigue. What can we do to alleviate that or help? And I'm going to assume he means we as in his family and, and her support system. What, I'm sorry, it broke up there for a second. Say that again. He, he said, um, okay, uh, Eddie, he said his wife starts chemo on Friday and she's been experiencing severe pain and fatigue and he says what can we do to alleviate that or help and I assume by we he means her support system. Well I think it's very important to be able to be understanding that the first couple of days following chemotherapy can be the most difficult ones because that's a time in which the uh, medication and their side effects can be can be the worst. However as time goes on, it really depends on the type of treatment that you're receiving. So if you're receiving chemotherapy on a weekly basis, that may be something that could be easily tolerated. However, for those that are taking higher doses of chemotherapy, you may experience those side effects and so forth later on 
about 10 to 14 days. So the only thing I could suggest to you is that you ask her, look, what do you need me to do? What can I be helpful with? You know, what can I do to help you make it through this? If she needs medications, and then, then you monitor her medications, and her spouse can monitor the medication to make sure that she is not overdosing on her pain meds, not taking meds incorrectly, providing nutritional support, not forcing her to eat, but encouraging her to eat, and making sure that her activities are, that she's, that she's able to get up, move around, and not sitting around and laying around on the couch or on the bed. So even though it may be a challenge and it might seem as a nuisance or annoying, encouragement is probably the key factor here. Okay. Thank you so much. Eddie, I hope that helped um, to provide some insight on what you and your family and her support system can do as she goes through uh, her survivorship journey. Uh, thank you so much. Again, Dr. Jag, uh, we only have a few minutes left, and Eddie says thank you. Um, and we don't currently have any other questions. However, I do want to encourage, um, and again, th thank you so much for your presentation. I want to encourage you, uh, if you are on the webinar and you couldn't think of anything right, right away, if you have some thoughts later on, please, uh, Dr. Jag is available at his website, drjag.com. And I think, Dr. Jag, you also mentioned uh, in the information I receive, you're all over social media. Do you, you have, um, you're on Twitter at Dr. Jag as well, correct? That's okay, so you can also find Dr. Jag on Twitter at, at Dr. Jag, and you can also go to his website, drjag.com, and that's Jag with two Gs. And that is uh, fantastic. Dr. Jang, thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of Sisters Network, we truly appreciate your support of Sisters Network. And it's at Dr. Jag with just one G, but your website has two Gs, correct? <laughs> OK. drjag.com. Uh -huh. OK, good. OK. All right, because we definitely want to find you if, if we have some uh, further questions and just to follow you and see uh, what's going on as it relates to metastatic breast cancer. So on behalf of Sisters Network, I want to thank all of you uh, for tuning in today. Uh, Sisters Network is celebrating 20 years of survival. Um, here in Houston, the website will open soon. Uh, registration uh, hopefully will begin uh, the early part of July. We're putting the finishing touches on the agenda, so we hope that you all will join us here in Houston. And remember, Sisters Network is on social media, so please like us at Sisters Network on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. And for national events and up-to-date information on our programs and services, please visit our website at Sisters Network, Inc. Dot org. So again, thank you all so much for tuning in today. And on behalf of Sisters Network, thank you for joining us for Webinar Wednesday. Enjoy the balance of your life. Thank you.